So I'm thrilled to welcome you all uh, for this late afternoon, Marion Alsop and Sandy Toxvig in conversation, which is an uh, exciting event as part of the Newnham's 150th anniversary celebrations. We've got audience members from around the world, the US, Italy, Denmark, Canada, France, Japan, Ireland and Germany. Well, that's just to name a few. Marion and Sandy are both honorary fellows of Newnham. We're very honored to have them as honorary fellows, not least because both of them symbolize what, as we were preparing for the 150th, you told us you value about Newnham. You value being pioneers and pathfinders, which they both are. They demonstrate courage and curiosity, and they're both exceptionally talented individuals operating in spheres where teamwork also matters. And talent and teamwork are two words you associate with Newnham. So a little bit about each of them. Marin Alsop is one of the foremost conductors of our time, internationally recognised for her innovative approach to programming and audience development, her deep commitment to education and her advocacy for music's importance in the world. The first woman to serve as the head of a major orchestra in the United States, South America, Austria and Britain. She is, as the New York Times put it, not only, I quote, a formidable musician and a powerful communicator, but a conductor with a vision. The 2019-20 season marked Marin's first as chief conductor of the ORF Vienna Radio Symphony Orchestra, and I believe she's in Vienna at the moment, and she has long-standing relationships with many other orchestras the world over. She's recognized with multiple gramophone awards, with extensive discography, including recordings for Decca, Harmonia Mundi, and Sony Classical. She's the first and only conductor to receive a MacArthur Fellowship and has been honored with the World Economic Forum's Crystal Award. In 2013, she was the first female conductor of the BBC's Last Night of the Proms. And to promote and nurture the careers of female conductors, she founded the Taki Concordia Conducting Fellowship, renamed in her honor as the Taki Alsop Conducting Fellowship. Sandy Toxvig, OBE, was born in Denmark and brought up around the world in Europe, Africa and the United States. She began her comedy career at Girton College, Cambridge, where she wrote and performed in the first all-women footlights show. Sandy is well known to UK audiences as a broadcaster, a television career including Call My Bluff and Whose Line Is It Anyway? She's been host of BBC Two's hugely popular quiz show QI, hosted The Great British Bake Off, and is perhaps best known to many people as the chair of the News Quiz, which led to her induction into the Radio Hall of Fame in 2012. Much of Sandy's time is devoted to writing, and she just told us that during lockdown that's been particularly so, and in 2019 she became president of the Writers Guild of Great Britain. She has more than 20 fiction and non-fiction books for children and adults to her name. She's also an activist for gender equality and in 2014 co-founded the Women's Equality Party. Thank you both so much for joining us this afternoon. You'll be covering a great range of topics this evening from classical music and female composers to the challenges of being the first uh, in or among the first in your male dominated fields. At the end, there'll be time for some Q&A. So if you feed that through into the Q&A, um, I'll feed some of those. Um, but basically, we're just very privileged to be able to eavesdrop on a conversation between these two amazing women. Marion, Sandy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, I love to be with something stabilised. Uh, the whole way through, we were waiting for something to stabilise. In my <laughs> experience of my career, and nothing has stabilised. Um, so, um, Marion, I said yes because I thought I was going to get to see you. That was the main reason. Yeah, that's the only reason I said yes, too. But it's nice to even see you virtually because it's been a long time. No, we did a test call earlier in the week and we didn't stop talking. So we have to we have to be careful now what we're going to say. I had, <laughs> very, uh, I had a very strange thought. Uh, I had never really thought about where you grew up. So you grew up in uh, New York City. I Is did. that right? In the city itself? I didn't grow I didn't grow up in the in the woods of, of Denmark <laughs> at all. Well, well, I spent most of my childhood in New York City in the 60s. I wondered if we'd ever kind of crossed paths. It had never occurred to me before. So I grew up yes, in Westchester. Uh, maybe we where in where in Westchester? Mamaronic. I well, after once my parents found uh, two dimes to put together, they bought a little house in Dobbs Ferry. I in know Westchester yeah. also. Yeah. How funny yeah, is that? I'm 
I'm sure our paths crossed at some point. At some point we must have been somewhere, but they were both musicians, isn't that right? Is that, I mean, did you have any choice? Is it like you went into the family business? No, I, I you know, not only did I have no choice, but I actually, I think their motivation for having a child was really, a, they just wanted a pianist. And so they said, well, what the hell, let's make one. And so that's why, so I was born with a job and that was it. I was supposed to be a pianist and uh, yeah, I hated the piano though, Sandy. I, I'm not sure I ever told you that story. I just, I hated it. It was the wrong instrument. And I retired from the piano when I was six. Yeah, I think that's six as you peaked at that point. Yeah, I peaked, I had already peaked. And yeah. uh, twinkle, then they twinkle. tricked me into, <laughs> into playing the violin. And that, but it was interesting because already I, there was a different, I had a different relationship with the instrument, you know, and I, I, in, in retrospect, I think it was very helpful because I could really see from, you know, as I got older, that there's, there's an instrument for every child. And if a parent starts the child on the wrong instrument or an instrument that doesn't really connect with them, that they can't connect to, um, music sometimes doesn't take root. And uh, what was it about the violin that did, did it just feel comfortable straight away as you put it up? Yeah, I think it's a, <clears throat> I think it's the physicality of the violin, that the timbre of the sound, you know, the the way it vibrates against your body, and then of course for me as an only child, it was the social aspect of playing with other people, and not that you couldn't as a pianist, but the piano is so formidable, you know, it doesn't really let you connect with people in the same way. And I just loved the violin and then I started playing in orchestra and that was my true passion. And was it always classical music? Did, were your parents classical musicians? Uh, they were both um, professional classical musicians, but my dad was a kind of a renegade and <clears throat> he, he loved playing jazz. He played saxophone, he played clarinet, he played flute. He even whistled all the time, which was highly annoying um, <laughs> until he was whistling on, um, some commercial date he was doing and then he got hired to do all the Irish spring commercials and he made more money than he made ever playing all the other instruments so we my mother and I would try to tolerate that so it was a you know it was a it was a classical upbringing but it it was really interspersed with a lot of jazz and a lot of um a lot of swing music so I was exposed to that but of course I was a complete classical snob at the age of 11 and uh <clears throat> but eventually that came back. And uh, when I was uh, about 20, I started a swing band um, and I played in that swing. We have we had our swing band for 20 years together. What did you so, play in the swing band? I, uh, I, I played violin and uh, it was what well, was very unusual. It's a string it was an all woman string swing band. I know it, it, it had that effect. Everybody said, mm, great idea, not. But <clears throat> surprisingly, it was really amazing and incredible. Uh, we played at a jazz club in New York for many, many years. And uh, then some producers came and heard us. Uh, Phil Raymond, who's he was a fantastic record producer. And he um, introduced us to a couple of his artists. So Billy Joel became one of our big fans and we're on a lot of his albums. And uh, we work with Paul Simon. And so it ended up being an incredible uh, opportunity ultimately. Fantastic. But there's something about growing up with music, isn't there? My father played uh, piano and my mother uh, as well. And then my dad learned to play the clarinet and they would, and most evenings they would play music. And I remember one evening, uh, my father saying, this piece needs some uh, bass, we double bass. We need a double bass. We don't have a double bass. So he went off into the garage and he came back with a, a galvanized bucket and a stick and a piece of string. And he had drilled a hole in the bottom of the bucket. He turned it upside down. He put the string through it and put the hole onto the bucket and started playing. <laughs> and it was the most wonderful noise. But you see, this is why you're good at DIY. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That was it. Well, Sandy, what instrument did you play growing up? Uh, well, uh, uh, violin, but I'm embarrassed to tell you that because <laughs> I was truly terrible. I mean, my violin came with an oil can. It was a very, I, I don't think I found the instrument that I was supposed to play. But maybe that wasn't your instrument. I think that is, a, I think that's a real problem and I, and it's something that I'm very interested in. I, I believe every child has the possibility to write a wonderful story, has the possibility of being able to make some music and has the possibility, for example, of, of what the Americans call phys ed sports to be part of their life. So I, I think that all of those things are really important. And what happens, for example, if you are not the person who's going to 
I don't know, run faster than anybody else, you just end up at the sidelines and you don't, sport doesn't become a natural part of your life. If you don't show a propensity to the one instrument that you got given, music doesn't become a natural part of your life. And I think that's true about drama and all sorts of things. I, I wish we were much more all rounded in how we approached it uh, with the kids in terms of it becomes It becomes so competitive, I think, for kids that it, it's really, it, it's so off-putting instead of it just being woven into part of their lives. I agree. But I also think that we we sometimes, our expectations aren't high enough for kids. You know, I've watched kids, when you set the bar really, really high, they, they usually make it and exceed your expectations. When you set it low, you're really doing a disservice. Absolutely, and also to find the thing that they're interested in. I'm lucky enough to have grandchildren now. And uh, I was chatting to my four-year-old grandson and I said, uh, what to particular animals do you like? And he, without taking a breath, he went, mostly nocturnal. And I went, oh, okay. Uh, so it's trying to, wow, you're four, uh, and you already know that this is what you like. And so we, we do need to, we do need to encourage them and make sure that they have every opportunity because they will surprise us. I, I've now got oh. a collection of 40 nocturnal animal things in the house that we play with. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. I love. well, at least now you know what to get for every birthday. I know that's right. Oh. I've got to get something nocturnal. Something um, nocturnal. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, I've never said that phrase before. No, um, no it was Sandy, not, where, <laughs> not my thing. You, when did you start um, down the comedic path? Was that something that was always part of your life? No, I saw, there's a bit of me that feels like never is the answer. <laughs> Still um, searching. I, no, well, so I come from a funny family. People in my family say funny things. That's the whole family is always laughing and joking. And, and intentionally they say yeah, funny yeah, yeah, things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My okay. mother is very funny and um, my grandparents. And it was just a thing where everybody was always laughing and joking. But, but whenever I see myself described as a comedian, I'm slightly baffled by it because this is not how I see myself. I find the world funny and I'm amused by it. But the word comedian just suggests that that's, I don't know what it is. It's just like, that's all there is to you. Um, so I, I like to think I'm a writer who occasionally says funny things, um, but it doesn't matter how many books I write. I mean, more than 25, I think now books, nobody ever describes me as an author or a writer, <laughs> always describe me as a comedian. And I, I don't know what that's about. I have no idea what that's about. But, but of course you do, because that's, you know, that's, that's the, that's the easy box to put you in because, you know, it requires so much more um, explanation when you say someone's a, an author, because then you have to, you know, and you're, you've written so many different types of books too, that it's not easy to categorize, I think. And, and then everyone knows you from television, so it's easier to put you into that box, huh? Yeah, it is easier, but maybe that's something we like to do. We like to pigeonhole people, but I wonder, I mean, maybe I, I'm always looking for some terrible influence from the patriarchy, but we're more willing to do it to women, that men are allowed to be all rounders and do all kinds of different things, but women have to, you have to know what's the thing that they do. Do you think that's true or is that me just being overly sensitive? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure I'm always willing to jump into that swimming pool as fast as possible with you, but I, I do think that, uh, I do think that it's a tendency that we do this to everyone to some degree. Um, and I do think that having <clears throat> having talent in a lot of areas is it, it it's a great blessing, but sometimes it can be a little bit of a curse because people are not so comfortable. you know, why are you why are you interested in that? Why are you getting involved in that? You just conduct. Just do your music. Yeah, I get that a lot. you know, don't use your brain. I mean, that's what I feel like they're saying to me. Don't think. just do your music. Stay and, in your lane. You know, exactly. Stay in your lane. And I guess, especially studying, because I studied with my great idol, Leonard Bernstein, who was, you know, I don't know how many talents he had, but Amazing. Stephen Sondheim wrote, rewrote the lyrics um, to a, a great tune. And, you know, poor Lenny, 10 gifts too many. And it's true. <laughs> you know, because people hated when he would write a piece for the paper or then he would go here and discuss linguistics you know that it made them crazy it well, just the do most your music things i ever saw was a documentary about him uh conducting the album of west side story uh, uh oh oh but but this is it, it was that the video yeah that you saw yeah. so here's an amazing fun fact which is that my dad 
is sitting in the second desk of violins, first violins. So he's in almost every shot. So next time you watch it, he's on the outside in the second stand of violins. Wow, is that how you met Bernstein in the first place? Or was it through your dad? Is that what happened? I'm actually, the other thing you don't know is that it might've been one of the sessions where I was standing in the back of the room because I, I, said, I said to my dad, you have to, you're not allowed to go without taking me. You know, and I tried to be as still as a, um, you know, like a coat rack, so no one would notice me the whole time. What's but it that like, was amazing. What's it like to meet your hero like that? You know, I think that, I think that um, it's so hard in some ways to, to have heroes, isn't it? I mean, it, it's complicated, let's say. Um, and I have to tell you that Leonard Bernstein he was my hero from the age of nine and I first saw him conduct. And then when I finally became his student and met him and started working with him, he exceeded every expectation I had. He was so much better in person and in the flesh than he was in my mind even. So he, he was a great, he's a great example, I think of the kind of the perfect hero. Um, he, he was wonderful. Uh, he was so generous. He was so wacky so crazy so unpredictable so demanding so affectionate i mean this covid would have made him crazy yeah. i he would have had covid every three days <laughs> I, he could not keep his hands off every he needed to hug everyone and kiss everyone you know he would he would jump up after he, he knocked me off the podium i mean he was like a a large a large puppy you know <laughs> just couldn't couldn't stop himself it's just the and thing i hope, missed most the hugging Hugging and I think uh, I think so too. It's yeah. and it feels so um, it feels so strange when you see someone you haven't seen and you you have to you know hold back in that way. Did you grow up with with an external hero or heroine? Um, well, I uh, the, the person who um, I, I wanted to go into comedy for was Lucille Ball um, because oh my god, I loved her. Yes, yes, just a genius, a genius. The person who invented situation comedy. The her comedy timing was second to none. And then the other persons whose comedy timing I loved, which maybe sounds surprising, was Julie Andrews. Uh, Julie Andrews. Oh, she's wonderful, yeah. Just a, she has comedy timing. And there's a really interesting overlap, which I don't know if anybody's ever kind of looked into. There's a very interesting overlap between being musical and being comedic, I think. Because I'm always saying to the younger comics, I say, have you got any advice? I say, you must listen to the audience as much as you are talking to them. You must listen to what's coming back to you. Because right. you... So when, a, when, you have, when you do a joke and the first laugh comes in, it's a bit like a small wave, ideally, it's like a small wave comes in. If you hit that wave in exactly the right place with the next joke, an even bigger wave will come. If you hit it in the wrong place, it won't come. And, <laughs> and it's really hard to explain, but to me that feels a bit like, me, that if I hadn't had a musical family and I hadn't mm -hmm. learned music, maybe I wouldn't quite hear it in the same way, but the audience and I are making something between us. It isn't just me. Yeah, speaking. no, I totally, I totally get that. It's, um, yeah, I think it is a very musical give and take that you have to know when to pause and when yeah. to listen, when to let them react. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it's quite, quite challenging. And every night. Did you different. ever, yeah, of course it is. Now, my only other, um, the other um, comedian who I absolutely adored growing up was Carol Burnett. Oh, I thought she was hysterical. I mean, really, I but loved Carol her. But Burnett with Julie Andrews together, they did a show together. In oh, the they United did. States. Fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely well, fantastic. I love Julie Andrews because of her. She's so, um, she's so proper and sophisticated so that when she breaks out in the comedy, it really goes against type. It was fantastic. And she was one of the people that I, that I, I never did meet Lucille Ball, unfortunately, but uh, I did meet Julie Andrews. And uh, you've known me a long time, Aaron. Is the only time I had no words. I was completely speechless. I, I just nothing. I started to speak and nothing came out at all, because I, I was. This is what uh, this is exactly what I had with Leonard Bernstein. The first time I was introduced to him, I just nodded. <laughs> I nodded. He asked me some questions and I nodded. I don't know what they were. I was so overwhelmed. I know. <laughs> Um, tell me something, uh, because uh, all the people that I've met in the classical music world, I've been privileged to meet, are good fun and a laugh and everything. You know, you talked about this as kind of a slight uh, snobbishness sometimes about uh, the classical music, but I think that's in the audience rather than in the people who 
who perform it. It's not my experience of the performers and conductors that I have got to know. Yeah, but I think you've gotten to know all of us lowbrow people. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, I I think that uh, I think that any kind of any kind of club becomes a bit of a problem for, from my perspective. You know, anything that feels like a closed system is something that I have trouble with. And, you know, classical music, of course, it's it, when you go back and you think about it and it, it, the, the patriarchy that, you know, that supported classical music. And then you had all the princes and the counts and the royalty and, you know, you worked for them and this and that. And it was it was owned by the elite and the wealthy people. And this has, I think, perpetuated itself uh, throughout time and st still exists there. I mean, if if COVID can do one thing, I hope it can break down some of these barriers that we've had. And, I, you know, for me, the resulting discussion, and uh, maybe it's not even a d discussion, but it's an openness um, out of necessity to new repertoire. Mm. It's phenomenal. Women composers, composers of color, underrepresented composers. You know, it's amazing to me when people say, well, do we still need a uh, fellowship for women conductors? And I turn to them and I say, yeah, well, who are the women on the podiums of the world? You know, where, uh, of course we need this. You know, you've had the old boys club for centuries. We need an old girls club. You know, we nice. really, we need that. We need that kind of support. So I think I'm, I'm concerned a little bit, and this was something I wanted to ask you about, Sandy. I'm concerned that this pandemic, I mean, first of all, it's, it's hurt so many people. So of course my heart goes out on that level. It's hurt so many artists. And I'm also concerned that it has pushed women backward in, in their achievement, you know, because so many women have had to leave the workforce because of childcare issues, or they've, you know, their jobs have been eliminated because, you know, so I'm very, very concerned about women's rights. We were finally making some progress, I felt. Yeah. And I don't want to lose that ground. So I was wondering how you were thinking about that. And, and do you have any advice coming out of this pandemic? I mean, it's really interesting. I was with a very, uh, I, I had a meeting with a high powered friend of mine yesterday. She was very irritated. She's a very senior woman in publishing and her husband has been made redundant and she is working full time. Something happened to one of the children at school and they phoned her. Oh. They phoned her, yeah. they didn't phone yeah. him. And she said, I'm working, I'm working. What is this, the 1950s that you can't understand that he's available and I'm in a meeting. How is it that you can't understand that? And if you look at the statistics of the women who've been made redundant, the women who uh, didn't get any money for furlough and so on, it's the highest percentage of the workforce. And the, and the yes. biggest worry is, is the women who had uh, part-time jobs uh, that are now being uh, moved out. I, I'm, I'm rather resolutely at the moment, when I go to the supermarket, I always go to the woman on the till. I'm very worried that it's just going to be robotic tills. It's just going to be scanning. Well, tills. I'm worried about that too, that I think I think many, many of the jobs will, will be automated. Yeah, and that really concerns me. You know what I'm like, darling, I'm an activist. I'm a, a busy, uh, on Saturday, I shall be out leafleting for the Women's Equality Party. We're standing, we have elections here. Uh, and uh, I shall be out uh, trying to raise uh, awareness and so on. But but it, I know that it works. So, for example, in in your field, if I don't know if you remember when the Philadelphia Orchestra announced their 2018 to 19 season, there wasn't a single uh, woman composer in it. And since that time, when it was brought to their attention, they have now started leading the way, the Philadelphia Orchestra. So I think sometimes, if just saying stuff and going, we need to pay attention here, people, is is what we have to do. We have to keep doing that old fashioned feminist thing of consciousness raising. But what I, tell me it's this, and I don't understand this. There's so many wonderful female composers. And indeed you've conducted for me in a show that I was hosting at the Royal Festival Hall, fabulous women composers. There's nothing, what, what's the sex difference of co composing music? Is there, why is there a problem in finding women composers? There's some amazing ones. Yes, I think that I think that this is a it's a complex question, of course, because it's a it's a little bit of a, a question about a, a broader societal issue, um, which is that without opportunity 
or with limited opportunity, it's very, very hard to grow to be the best version of yourself. So, so few women over history have had the opportunity to hone their craft. You know, composers get better the more they compose, the more they hear their music, the more input. If you have only one chance, you know, it's unlikely that you're going to be the most groundbreaking, avant-garde, risk-taking um, composer, or that you will have peaked. So I think that it is so much about opportunity. And I think it's the same for conducting, that women need to have the opportunity to fail. You know, if a woman writes a piece that composes a piece that isn't quite there, then the response is, well, I told you, you know, women can't compose. And then it's shut down. If a man does that, you know, often it's, well, you know, he's growing into his voice. But it's so that, I, it's that, and you must have felt that, that I've always felt if I fail, then I'm failing all womankind. That if, if, if I get given a show to host and no woman's ever hosted a primetime show like that, and I don't do a good job, then no woman will ever get the chance again. And that's too much of a burden for one well, person. It, it really is, but I think that, um, you know, I have to say that I think there had to be someone to do it first, and I'm glad you did it, <laughs> and I'm glad I did it, because we're, we're tough people. You know, it requires a, I mean, we're softies inside, but it requires a certain kind of determination that not everyone has. And but so I, I feel like we, it was it was up to us, Sandy, in many ways to do it so that others won't have to suffer quite so much. But I like your attitude to your work. And maybe that's one of the reasons why we became friends is that we're both, once we finished work, we're both quite, <laughs> put it behind us. I remember going out to dinner with you after you'd first, I think it was your first conducting of the first night, of, the last night of the bronze. And I started to say something about the concert and you immediately turned the subject to talking about something else. <laughs> you finished work. You finished work. We're, yeah, about we're done. We're done with that. It, <laughs> it seemed to go well. well yes. Move on. Yeah. It was fine. We'll do some talk about something else now. Do what makes you anxious? What is the stuff that makes you anxious when you're working? When I'm working, oh, uh, no, nothing really makes me anxious. I mean, uh, stupidity makes me anxious. Yes, I everywhere. Mm. You know, I mean, not that I'm the most intelligent on the block, but I, I think I think also an, a lack of inventiveness, a lack of willingness to um, evolve. I love working with people who say, whose answer is always yes, um, but yes, okay, well, let's talk about it. Let's talk that through. Let's, let's think, is this a possibility? Hmm. Is this something that would enhance what we're doing? I think that that, for me is what makes me, makes me, and, and that's my biggest struggle is, is trying to, trying to keep a positive upward momentum in the evolution of the industry I'm in. Uh, and you know, it's an industry that's so conservative and it hangs on to the past and they don't want it. You know, I've been asking for almost 10 years now, are subscriptions really the way of the future? You know, and no one has been willing to have this discussion with me. Oh, or whether I've said, you know, why don't we see more women on the podium? Why don't we see more women composers represented? No, you know. <laughs> talk to me, talk anyway, to me. that's what makes me crazy. No, I'm with you on all of that. I, if, if some, the, the thing that most fires me up is somebody saying it's never been done before. And I go, okay, well, it's... Yeah. Let's see what we can okay. do. Uh, maybe I go take it one step further. When they say to me, oh, you can't do that. I'm like, okay, I got it. Uh, I'm here. I, as soon yeah. as I hear the word, yeah. you can't do that. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Talk to me about the uh, Tacky Allsop Conducting Fellowship. That must have meant a lot to you when it was renamed with your name. Yeah, it was very nice. Uh, this past year, they... they the board voted to rename the fellowship. Um, but this was, a, this was a fellowship I started in 2002. And uh, the reason it's called um, uh, Mr. Taki's name is on it is because he was the one who helped me start my first orchestra. And I played at his wedding, my swing band played at his wedding. 
and he paid us in cash. So I thought he would be a good candidate. <laughs> to the board. And uh, I went and met with him and he said, well, you know, I, re I really don't like classical music. <laughs> and I said, that's okay. I don't. And he said, but I'll help you. And for almost 20 years, he helped support my orchestra. And when we finished uh, the project, you know, when my career became too busy, he said, look, we've achieved what we set out to, you know, you're on, you're one of the leading uh, conductors now. He said, but what about all the other women that are struggling? And I thought, you know, you're right. If I don't change this paradigm, who's going to really look at it? So I started this fellowship and I named it after him because I am so grateful to him. And so far we've had uh, 24 recipients and 18 are currently music directors. They're from 16 nationalities and they're doing incredible work. And I'm, I'm so proud of them because not only are they wonderful conductors, they're also wonderful citizens of the world. You know, they wanna give back. They wanna use music as a vehicle to connect with their communities. But thank you for asking. I, I do oh, appreciate that. I'm so that. proud of you. I think it's so. I, I think it's so wonderful. But you are very busy, and you are always traveling around the world. Uh, is there a bit after the lockdown that you think, you know, I might just stick to the orchestra in my backyard? I mean, you're in where are you, Vienna, at the moment, right? You often will send me a picture. I, you sent me a picture of a teddy bear from São Paulo. Was it a rabbit? Maybe it was a rabbit. Um, <laughs> it might have been a rabbit. Yeah, it might have been a rabbit. Um, you're always traveling. Is there a bit of you that thinks maybe that, that I could do with not constantly? being on the road now? Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, I think we've all, and, and I'm curious about your take on it too, I think we've all had an opportunity to reassess, you know, why we're running around the globe like crazy people. And, you know, is it really that important that you hear me conduct Mahler's Third Symphony when someone nearby could do it probably fairly well? you know, you start to think about, it. I also am very concerned about the planet and my contribution to the carbon footprint. But I know, I think you're like me, that traveling is not, is not our um, number one favorite thing to do. Am I, am I correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if so, I could spend the next five years sitting in a library, I would be fine. You know, I'd be entirely content. But this has this has been in many ways a, a dream come true for you to be able to stay at home and focus on writing. Yeah. And how many how many a dozen books? How many did you write over this <laughs> <laughs> one a month? Just a couple. Um uh it has been, I mean, I'm very privileged and I'm really aware of that. I'm so aware of how many people don't have a garden space or a place to work and you know it's hard for them to concentrate or they don't have the technology and so so i'm i'm horribly aware of that um but uh i've discovered something that i is so ridiculous i've been working for 40 years now uh and i've just discovered something called the weekend so um my wonderful wife who you know well uh she said we have to differentiate our days because the lockdown is starting to feel like yesterday is the same as tomorrow and the same as today and it all feels a little bit beige so let's start taking the weekends off well, I haven't had a weekend off in all my working life. I've always worked pretty much seven days a week. Nor I. No, yeah. it's the most marvelous thing, Marin. I couldn't recommend it too highly. So she said, to, she said I said, um, should we go to the park? She said, oh, the park would be very busy. Let's do pretend parks. So we laid a, a, a blanket on the ground in the garden and pretended we were in the park. We had a most marvelous afternoon. So I, I think I might start having days where I don't produce anything. And actually it's yeah. fine. It's fine as well to just be in the moment and lie under the apple tree. And I didn't, did, I know it's ridiculous, but I didn't know that. It's fine. I thought every day had yeah. to be something. No, I think, I think we're, we're made from the same cloth that I too feel that a day without enormous productivity hmm. is a lost day. But I think during this time, a, a day for me, a day without a joyful thought to me is now a lost day. Uh, and I wouldn't have said that before. I, I think finding the joy in the small things in life has been uh, a, a real discovery for me. Well, and because I've been in my garden such a lot now, I, I know <laughs> where individual birds make their life. I know their noises and I got binoculars and I started looking at them and I'm interested and I can hear them calling to each other. And um, there's one little bird that is clearly desperate for a mate because he keeps doing the mating cry. 
and I was in another part of London, about half an hour away, and I heard the same bird. And I thought, why are you two not getting together? What is wrong? I can do <laughs> the same oh. cry. And I thought, oh, I've become that person who knows bird songs. You know, I, it's funny you should say this because I'm I'm not the outdoorsy type really, but also we had a bird at our home that she decided to set up shop and make her nets there. And I named her Josephina. And of course, when anybody wanted to do an interview, they had to, we had to all stay on the porch, you know, and be distance. And Josephina is the loudest bird ever. Tiny little bird, unbelievable projection. She could take down any interviewer. It was amazing. <laughs> Maybe it's the same, but there's a bird that the could be. There's a bird called a cold tit, and it does four notes exactly the same, very high pitched, very loud, over and over again. Drives me insane. But I, I think <laughs> I, I sort of gradually got used to it. Um, so I, do do tell us though, Sandy, what what books were you working on, and, and what well, I published what has come a book out? Called Toxic's Almanac, um, which is for every day of the year, uh, has a different woman from history who you might not have thought about. Uh, and there's so many, I could have published a million almanacs. Um, I mean, today, for example, April the 1st, uh, Sophie Germain, I'm not even sure she's in my book, uh, an incredible French mathematician, a physicist and a philosopher. Uh, she was born today, 1776, which is a big day, a big year for the United States. Uh, and she, it was the French Revolution when she uh, was a child, the Bastille fell in fact when she was 13. And so she was confined to the house. So it's a kind of lockdown, a different kind for a different reason, but there was <clears throat> so much disruption in the streets. But she was lucky enough that her father had a library and girls were not educated, but because they didn't know what to do with her because nobody could go out because there was so much going on, she was allowed to read her father's books and she became a genius. She's one of the pioneers of um, elasticity theory. Uh, uh, unfortunately, she was not allowed to study because she was a woman. Um, so she used to write letters as Monsieur uh, Leblanc uh, to great mathematicians and ask them uh, really complex questions. Um, she was an astonishing woman. And it, so today is a great day to think about her. And I, what I discovered was there wasn't a single day where I wasn't enthused and excited about a woman that maybe I hadn't really thought about before. Um, so the, I think so writing history... So, so it's 365 days, uh, 365 women? Well, there's more than that because I pepper it with some, a few others here and there. Um, I figured, and so that you have the bonus offerings. Oh, it sounds fantastic. I can't wait to read it. I mean, this I is a perfect, people. Um, do you, perfect example though of why, why we have to forge ahead and really put the issue of gender equality front and center because our stories, women's stories are not valued and they're not preserved and they're not told. Yeah. And um, Sandy, I told you the story of um, Sylvia Kadu, who I met in Lucerne. Yeah, tell me again. I didn't, I didn't, I had done a master class, and this older woman in her 80s came to speak to me. I thought, geez, she seems to know a lot about conducting. And someone in the crowd said, oh, do you know who that is? And they told me her name, Sylvia Kadu. And I, I'd never heard the name before. I had never heard her name before. As it turns out, she was the first woman to conduct the New York Philharmonic, the Berlin Philharmonic. She was Bernstein's assistant in 1966. Oh my God. She goodness. won the Metropolis. I mean, unbelievable. And I had never heard of her name. So I went back with a film crew and uh, filmed uh, an interview with her so that we would have it. But we're, we're good friends now. And she still lives in the film. I, I came across a woman that you may have heard of called Wilma Neruda. She was uh, better known as Lady Halle. Have you heard oh, of her? Wow, I've heard, but tell me the story. So she was uh, from Morovia. She was a virtuoso violinist. Uh, she was a kind of wunderkind. Uh, so she was born in 1838. She was the first woman violinist considered good enough to rank with the great male performers. And I would suggest almost nobody would have known, would know about her. If she led the way for female violins to be able to have a solo career. Um, and you, I suspect you know, this is, is why isn't every child taught about these, especially musician kids that are interested in music? I mean, it's unbelievable what a disservice we do. So well, we have to change that. One of the first conversations you and I had was about Florence Price. Do you remember we talked? I'd become so excited. Of course, and have come across finally, her. finally, she's getting recognition these days. 
But um, when she went to, was it New England Conserv Conservatory? Yeah. I think when she was 14 years old, something like that. She had to um, go in as uh, pretending that she was Cuban, I believe. Yeah, she was African-American. Because an African-American wouldn't have been allowed in, into the school. But there's, every time I look, and I try and look worldwide as, as well, I just discovered the first uh, woman, uh, to, uh, first person to, to write a Bengali opera, okay? So it is, happens to be a woman, but she's, she's, she's the first person to write a Bengali opera. And you just think, well, how amazing, how amazing that these firsts are happening all over the world. So it isn't even just the stories from our own neck of the woods that we need to gather together. It's the stories from, from all over. So the next uh, big thing that I'm working on is I'm going to do a, um, an atlas of the world, um, which will show you for every country in the world, a few famous women from that country and what the current status is of, of gender equality in that country. So I'm just trying to make sure we expand our horizons and we don't go, well, we've got it sorted now, we're okay, because there's so much- Well, that's what I'm always worried about because that's what happens to women always. Yeah. You know, they say, well, listen, okay, we, we sort of made some progress, so let's not pay any attention. But I read an article just this morning that um, because of the pandemic there, they anticipate, I guess there was a report saying that it would take um, 100 years to achieve uh, gender equality, parity. Um, but now they've extended that to another generation. So now it's 136 years. So this is not acceptable. No, I don't <laughs> want to live that long, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> I think, I think I'll, be getting, I'll be getting a bit tired by then. I think that's possibly, that's possibly going too far. So the real question is, when are you coming to London? Are you, are, so many nights with you, I have had uh, literally the best time. And I'm going to think the one that stays in my mind is you conducting the Barbican Joan of Arc. It was a, was a black and white movie. Is that right? A black and white movie. Of uh, yes, that, the, the, um, the Carl Dreyer Oh. Uh, black and white film. That was pretty spectacular, huh? What a night that yeah. was. It was just incredible. Sitting That's there. an incredible film, of course, you know. Uh, with I think the film connoisseurs will know that one. Uh, it's, it's really quite amazing. And it's a, a score by a contemporary um, composer uh, named Richard Einhorn. I think he did a beautiful job using Joan of Arc's letters that she dictated, of course, um, and words. Yeah, it was fun. Well, let's let's make a plan. I mean, I have to say it's not so easy to run in and out of London anymore. Well, we have a house you can always come and stay. Um, do you have a favorite woman composer? Is there one that if is there a, like a gateway? What's the gateway drug, as it were, if people go, oh, I'm not sure about classical music. I don't think I know enough to enjoy it. Oh, gosh, that's that's so tough. I mean, there are a lot of women whose music I I, I really champion. Um, I would say right now, you know, British composer Anna Klein is up near the top of my list. And uh, of course, she was the one I asked for the, so the last night of the proms when I conducted there. And I'm just finishing up a couple CDs. I just recorded uh, probably a year and a few months ago with the um, LPO, uh, her cello concerto. And that was great fun. So I think she's, you know, it's music that you can relate to. It's got a personality. Um, I, I hesitate to, to use the word accessible because that seems to be a dirty word in art, but I think it's relatable. I think it is relatable. I was asked to introduce um, some Baron Boehm concerts by Beethoven concerts on the television recently. And a, a, a classical music critic said, who does Sandy Tuxley think she is talking about Beethoven? And I thought, well, who do you need to be to talk about Beethoven? He touched me and uh, touches all of us, I think. I don't, you don't need to be anybody. You just need to enjoy it. But this goes to what we were speaking about earlier, right? About keeping that club yeah. just for the people in the club. It's ridiculous. Of course, you're qualified. And I'm going to be doing some um, c comedy work myself soon, yes. too. So uh, I'll write some material. <laughs> Fine. And I'll bring up my uh, Alison, you have returned to us. Yes, thank you so much. So, so many questions coming in because there's so many, you, your conversations raged so widely. But picking up on that last one, Audrey Morse has asked, uh, wants to ask Marion a bit more about female composers and how you feel about those concerts that are programmed to only feature music by female composers. Is that a good thing because it sort of promotes them or a bad thing because it implies that their music wouldn't be 
be good enough to listen to in its own right? You know, this is a this is an important question, and I think you know Sandy can speak to it as well because when we've done we've done a few projects featuring the women only uh, the music only of women composers, but that is a very specific um, brief that we have. You know, where we're talking about bigger issues, I think related to women. I have tried to um, steer clear of this idea of, you know, ghettoizing women's music in this way so that it's just, I, I have been a huge advocate for really integrating women's music into the main season. I think that that is the key, at least from my perspective, not to just, um, not to just suddenly, you know, out of guilt or whatever, or out of, um, suddenly it's March, so we're gonna do women's music. I mean, it's the same thing for me with doing music by black composers because it's February, we're gonna do that. I mean, this is unacceptable. The, this music should be throughout our season. It's, it's music that has value, that offers us a different perspective. But it should be, it should start in schools. It needs to start early on. You know, it's not enough to teach children about Bach and Mozart, there's, there's so much more that they need to be educated about. And that's true for literature as well. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, everything, I would say everything start, needs to start early, right, Sandy? Yeah. I mean, you see from your grandkids, right? They, yeah. They're absolute geniuses. Yeah. It's just how much of that genius we suck out of them. Yeah, no, they're sponges. Society. They're just yeah. sponges for information if you let them. Yeah. yeah. And then moving to a question for, for Sandy, you mentioned early on the parallels between music and comedy timing and the importance of being in tune with the audience. And Claire King asks, but sort of in, in your author life, you're presumably writing long stretches without getting reader feedback. How do you find working in that sort of feedback void? And do you prefer one or the other or just get different things from they're, them? They're completely different. Uh, uh techniques that you're using. I'm sure it's the same for Marin. If she's in front of a live audience or she's in the recording studio, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're working in a completely different way. Uh, so when I've written for children, I've written for adults, I've written fact, I've written fiction. I, I always try and imagine who my audience is, who, who am I writing the book for? Um, but it's not that you need the constant feedback. And I think, so that, that, that rather with the comedy makes it sound like you need the laughs and you need the applause, you don't. What I'm saying is you have to listen. It's, it's part of the process that you're listening to them. Um, but I don't think I'm the sort of person who, if I gave up performing, I would die. I would be just fine. <laughs> it's not. It's not that I live for uh, the uh, you know the attention. Um, it's just what I was trying to say is it's part of the skill set is that you're that you're paying attention to to what's happening in the room. And I don't know whether Marin would agree, but uh, certainly when I'm backstage, if there's two and a half thousand people, for example, out there waiting for you to come on, you can hear what kind of audience they're going to be. You can hear if they're going to be quick or they're going to be quiet or they're going to be restless. There's somehow that two and a half thousand people form one single personality for an evening. I don't know how that happens. I have no idea. But um, but it's then it's fun to play with. You think, oh, they're going to be a bit quiet tonight. I'll, I'll put in a few extra jokes at the top just to pep them up a bit. So but it's, I think it's just two very different processes writing and, and performing. Marion, do you want to extend that? What, what's the difference between sure. conducting? No, I think, uh, I think Sandy has it spot on that. Um, it's interesting because uh, it, another 150th anniversary um, this year is of the Royal Albert Hall. And so I've been doing a lot of interviews about the space and the, the experience, especially of the proms. And, you know, that's an audience that is so unique because they come knowing they're gonna have a great time. You know, when the audience comes knowing they're gonna have a great time, there's an energy that is, is palpable and so exciting. Um, and of course you can't, you can't count on that at every concert. Um, I think sometimes my audiences are tired. They've had a long day of work and Sandy will, you know, and you sense that and you feel that and maybe they're more contemplative and more introspective. And I try to, I think the way I pace a piece is really affected by the audience, by the energy. I think we don't tell our audiences how important they are to the creation of art in that moment. They are integral to that. Mm -hmm. I'm picking up on this sense of the physicality of it. And you talked about the physicality of playing the violin. Francis and I has asked, 
how how does that affect you conducting? Can you describe the physicality of conducting? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same. It's the same feeling. I I was drawn to the physicality of it uh, right away when I saw Bernstein first conduct. I thought, oh yeah, that's and it's it's about maybe it's about embrace, and that's what's so hard in this moment. You know, conducting is like embracing people, and probably because. Um, I'm quite a, an introverted person. I think there's something about conducting that is extremely appealing because it's about connecting, but it's connecting in a very safe way and you can go home afterwards, you know, no commitment. Um, Sandy, I don't know if it's the same for you when you perform. I'm always envious of you. You turn your back on the audience, how bloody mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stand and stare at them. I think that's very, that's, that's not fair at all. The thing Are is, you an you introvert seen, also? Huh? Well, if you haven't Are seen you Marin in... conduct, it's hard to describe. She is the music. She, I, I have never seen anything quite like it. The orchestra and Marin become as if it was one fluid, wonderful beast it's a fantastic experience watching Marin conduct and I have watched a lot of classical music over the years I have never seen anybody so take on the persona of the music it's so it's oh you're so kind no but it's a thrilling it's so much better than just hearing it it's a it's a it's a being with you in the room it's just, you can feel the excitement so and also you wear those you have that jacket with the red flashes don't you Which is yeah you know the, this was something I was getting a lot of at the start of my career you know a lot of journalists um would ask me, well, what are you going to wear? I mean, hello. And I, you know, and I would say, I thought I would wear some clothes. I mean, really, seriously. And um, so this became such a, uh, such an insidious question every time. And so then I thought, you know, I'm not just gonna wear the same old black suit everybody else wears. I want a little bit of, so then I put a little red around the cuffs and then after concerts, audience members would say, oh, where, how far does the red go? And so then I had the coats lined in red because I didn't want to disappoint anyone. And then it's uh, creeped up into the color. But so I've sort of designed all of my own suits <laughs> with the tailor, you know, directly, because I think they have to be, uh, at least for me, you have to have fun. If you don't have fun, what's the point? My dad always said, Look, if you don't enjoy the rehearsals, you'll never enjoy the concert. And he was right. It's a, it's a good life uh, philosophy. That's what we feel from you when you're conducting. We just feel um, so fully and 100% engaged and not judged. We don't feel like as an audience, we're going to make a mistake. And I think that's, that can be a problem in a classical concert. People worrying they're going to clap in the wrong place or they're going to do the wrong thing. Yeah, no, definitely. Mm -hmm. And turning to, to Sandy and uh, the fact uh, that traditionally comedy had been quite a, a male dominated section of entertainment. And one of our students who's currently directing a radio comedy sketch show for the Cambridge Light Entertainment Society asks, how do you think we can promote greater female involvement, especially in writing and production positions? You know, there's no one trick to it. You just have to keep doing it. You just have to keep at it. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's the same in the music world. Just don't go away. You know, I, I've been doing this a very long time, um, but that doesn't mean I haven't been knocked back and back and back and, and had to keep trying. Uh, but uh, I do feel we're getting somewhere now. I just uh, finished recording the new series of, of QI for BBC and uh, on a couple of occasions, the entire panel, apart from Alan, they were all women and, and we didn't mention it. We, we didn't say, oh, look at us. We've got an all female panel. We just got on with being funny. Um, uh, so the, the writing is the key to it, if I'm honest with you, because mm -hmm. uh, if the women don't write the sketches, then they will spend their entire comedy career saying the doctor will see you now and, um, <laughs> and not ever getting to pay the doctor. Um, so, the, so the writing is the, is the starting point uh, for all of it, I think. Um, but please, please, please keep going because, you know, I'm planning to retire at some point. <laughs> but I think perseverance is, is it. Ab absolutely. You just have to... You have to not give up. Yeah. And maybe it's that we're less intelligent or just more stubborn than the average bears. But I think Sandy and I just, we just didn't give up. No. And that's really key, you know, to, to pick yourself up. And, and I love what you're saying about, you know, we, we were a panel of all women and we didn't mention it. I, I took a 
I, I do the opening concert at the uh, World Economic Forum for the past few years and they were, the topic was that gender equality. And I decided just to take an orchestra of all women and never mention it. And that's what I did. And I think sometimes, you know, the understatement of this fact can sometimes speak volumes. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the way to do it. Yeah. And Sandy, you're obviously passionate about encouraging writers because you've taken on this position with the Writers Guild. Any uh, particular things that you want to achieve? And we've got lots of writers among our new alumni who would love to help. So what, 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 what are you hoping to achieve in that role? I mean, uh, my main job is to is to keep everybody cheerful with the guild, if I'm honest with you, um, but also to make sure that writers are treated properly. I think never have we um, needed story more in our lives than at the moment. We need games that we can get lost in. We need radio plays. Uh, we need we need uh, books. We, we need a story. We're in a very strange position at the moment, which is that uh, all writers talk about the story arc, the beginning, the middle and the end. And where we are at the moment is in an, in an incredibly in, incomprehensible place. We do not know where we're heading or what it'll be like when we get there. We don't know what the story arc is. And so we are dependent on writers to try and help us to escape. And music does the same. Music also has within it some something satisfying in terms of an arc. It's all about narrative though. It's all story. Yeah. I mean, music is all about story too. Absolutely. Yes. Well, we're running out of time now, so I won't be able to get through all of the questions, but it's just clear from them that you've really touched so many uh, people's hearts. People loved hearing about West Side Story. Uh, people loved about hearing the, the listening skills, I think, has resonated with people and how that listening in different ways. Uh, I think the message about keeping going and persevering is something I hear all the while that it's so easy to just take somebody else's opinion of you and no keep going keep determined and also you're demonstrating something I say to the students a lot is that the friendships you make along the way are really what keep you going and encourage you and it's been such a privilege to eavesdrop on on you know the, the fruits of your friendship this evening and, and the way you've obviously supported and encouraged and inspired each other's and continue to do so. We're very grateful to you, the Honorary Fellows of Newnham, really grateful for finding the time for this event. Um, we can't give you the usual round of applause, but I can tell you there's lots of lovely comments coming in. So huge, huge thanks, and really hope that we're able to welcome you to see each other again in person at Newnham before too long. So thank you very, very much indeed, and thank you to everyone. Uh, we were up to uh, 250 by the end, so thank you very much, everybody, and thank you to Marin and Sandy. And a, a round of applause. <laughs> thank you, Sandy. I, uh, I can't believe we didn't run out of things to say, Marin. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, so shall we just take it offline and continue, Sandy? Yeah, just carry on. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you, my friend. Miss you. Love Great. you. Bye. 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 Bye.